I, I'm here for a simple reason that over, over the last number of years, it's become obvious that many of our staff in nature conservation bodies don't have a great deal of institutional knowledge. I'm also here because I'm a born again believer in sustainable use, and that's very selfish because without sustainable use, we wouldn't have anything to eat. That's whether you're a, a vegan or whether you're a, uh, a vegan, I might add, I have a, a more biological description because often the term veganism is confused with being a conservationist. And I would like to say that I don't quite agree with that. I respect anyone who wants to be a vegan, but that makes you in my scientific things a herbivore <laughs> and, and not a conservationist. Uh, because the impact of uh, the mass monoculture that has developed around the world in order to keep us alive, or even the great tunnels that we have all over the country uh, growing chickens for KFC, are all having a huge negative impact on the biodiversity of this earth. So I don't think being any particular uh, choice of, of uh, article on your menu makes you a conservationist. What you do with your life, focusing on conservation, is what gives you uh, standing. Otherwise, you're just a herbivore if you're a vegan. Now, the, uh, what I would like to, to do, I'm going to take you through nearly a, uh, just over 100 years of conservation work in this province, because you happen to be in KZN, and therefore we feel that we've got a bit of a chance. It's taken us 100 years of effort to try to repair for our wildlife animals, our large mammals in particular. <clears throat> it's taken us over 100 years to get them back to somewhere they were back in the, uh, uh, in the days before w this country of ours was settled. In fact, South Africa survived. W once the settlers had got here, South Africa moved away from the normal uh, indigenous people living in balance with nature to the point where we began to overexploit it. And for the next 350 years, and that included everyone in South Africa, it was get your hands on wildlife. Every farmer had a gun. Guns uh, were the result of Nkosi Langle Bolela uh, uh, getting involved in a rebellion, and he was using them to shoot Elon and the Drakensberg as well. So it, it is a fairly universal combined effort by South Africans as a whole to wipe out our large mammal resources. And I'm going to take you through that quickly. Okay, by 1895, all the, all the animals scheduled on, on this uh, image uh, were on the verge of extinction. Uh, we were down to 17 black wildebeest. Uh, we were down to probably between 30 and 50 white rhino and probably the same black rhino. Hippos were a bit better in St. Lucia because swimming wasn't a popular activity in those days and it was quite difficult to hunt them. But for the main, virtually all of these animals are gone. And we have some here for the, simply to thank some private sector farmers who, who kept them on their properties rather than see them wiped out. So we have uh, Bontebok and the Cape that were looked after by one private sector farmer. We have uh, the mountain zebra which were looked after by one farmer and we have the black wildebeest which were looked after by one farmer. Black wildebeest, the lowest they got to was 17. That was the world population of the day. Now, <clears throat> all sorts of people got involved. Around 1895 here in KZN, it was the first province uh, to, to set aside protected areas specifically for mammals. So in 1895, we had Shishuyam, Filosi, and St. Lucia uh, put aside. And the men who looked after these places were underpaid, underprivileged, ignored, and they lived from hand to mouth. But they were South Africans. They weren't anyone in particular, and it's thanks to these people that we have some of these animals. Now, there are a lot of dramatic stories about who saved wildlife and who saved the white rhino. The people who saved the white rhino were the Natal colony politicians who set aside Umfalozi Game Reserve. The, the more modern uh, saviors of those people came when we already had 600 in Umfalozi. That was an operation and not a saving. There's a difference. And uh, so the, these are the people that we really owe. Alfia spent nearly 50 years working for a nature conservation, ending up in the Natal Parks Board, and it's to people like him and the incredible loyalty 
uh, that they, they gave us in conservation. We came with a strange concept of looking after wildlife. Fortunately, in Zululand, we had communities who had known that there was a degree of conservation carried out by King Shaka. Granted, it was a, it was a little difficult. It was like the Chinese methods of, of dealing with corrupt officials. You take them down to the sports ground and then you shoot them. Uh, that, that, uh, in, in those days, it, it was different. The first person we began to get, thanks to those gentlemen, we began to have too many animals in our parks. In fact, we started to shoot them. We shot everything that was, we felt was overrunning its, its habitat, and uh, we fed them to staff, we gave them away to locals, uh, uh, but it was not a very sensible uh, uh, position to take. A, because we didn't have any skills in this. And the first person to say, listen, we must make these animals available, put them back on farms and stuff, was Captain, uh, was uh, Peter Potter. And he started the first really efficient game capture operation catching Impala and Mkuzi. And you would go out in a short wheelbase Land Rover with all the staff hanging onto the side. They drive into a herd of uh, Impala and everyone would jump off and grab the Impala at whatever point past them, so, which could have been quite painful for the odd male in parlor. The, uh, and then uh, we then started to make these available. And we uh, marketed these by saying people could come and collect in parlor. Just bring a bucky into the decent cage and you could have them. And nobody came. And the following year, strange things, human beings, and the following year we put a price of one round fifty on an Impala, and since then we've never been able to supply the demand. So it's very, very strange indeed. And then following that, we then, uh, the Natal Parks Board then started a farm game extension service where we had specialist staff and scientists who went out to go and talk to people who had land to try to persuade them to put wildlife back that was compatible with their farming practice. Uh, going to the sugarcane area and suggesting they put an elephant, not a very sensible thing to do. But there were other things that could be uh, uh, looked after and bought and, and moved there, uh, which would broaden our biodiversity and especially our large mammal base. And we, we stuck in uh, uh, mainly with the more common species, and Yala has become incredibly popular. The blessed buck, these are on the retirement estate where I live too, the most contented blessed buck in the world. And the uh, uh, in the Drakensberg, we used to go out. It was still the Wild West era. When I worked in the Drakensberg, uh, we all ran around on foot or on horseback, and we used to go and catch calves on horseback, uh, which riding around in, in the Drakensberg is quite an exciting venture, <laughs> let me just show you. And at one stage, we even, thanks to Professor Abbott from the University of Natal in those days, uh, we even created our own Elan herd at Loteni, uh, which uh, regrettably uh, did not come to fruition because Professor Abbott retired and our, our scientific officer, Rudy Begalki, at the stage moved on to, to greener pastures. Wildebeest, I have mentioned, uh, they, uh, there are now about 50 or 60,000 of them in South Africa, so we have a great deal to thank the farmer for. Uh, red hartebeest, the same thing. Red hartebeest and black wildebeest used to feature every year on the exports from the colony of Natal. They were there because the colony of Natal depended on the sale of products like hides. And we know exactly when the red hartebeest went uh, extinct in the province because Colonel Vincent, our then director, we had three red hearted beasts left in the wild in South Africa or on a farm near Greytown and Colonel Vincent announced that they were going to capture them and put them into one of our protected areas and a, a conservation minded farmer went out and shot all three that night. So nature conservation was bekend as in the Talsa Farkarat in those days. We did not get on well with the farmers. They saw nature conservation uh, bodies being Im, uh, uh, imposing on the natural freedom of farmers and stuff. So it was a difficult period, and perhaps the term Farkarat was probably earned. Anyway, in 1954, in May, the last of the hartebeest, and it fell to my lot and some of my uh, colleagues to go to Northern Cape and bring him back again. And so uh, uh, we brought 22 calves back and, uh, uh, from the Northern Cape, and we started uh, uh, introducing them back into our province, and they have now done very well. Then came the Rhino Saga. Uh, Ian Plough, who was then the, the uh, uh, conservator, chief conservator in Zululand, he said we had too many uh, um, uh, white rhino in Mflozi, and he said, get on with it, we must try to capture them. And fortunately, Colonel Vincent uh, was aware of Tony Hartorn, who was a, a, a veterinarian working in Uganda, 
uh, trying to use drugs to catch, uh, to capture a hippo. And the colonel invited him to come down, and with him came the means whereby we could catch a uh, white rhino. It was a really, uh, he had a tremendous role, Tony Hartorn, in, in making it possible for us to move rhino. Then came the helicopter, and alas, all, all the shenanigans that we had in the drugs and big on horseback, and Ian and, and Nick and co in the Zululand chasing around after drug uh, rhino on horseback, all that came to an end. This was a game changer uh, in, in wildlife conservation around South Africa as a whole. And uh, the white rhino was, was no exception. It enabled us to sharpen up our ability to get these animals. And in one peak season, uh, due to a drought, we removed over 650 white rhino from Umfalozi alone. So, and it could be done. We could take them out up to 20 a day. It was an amazing uh, uh, project. And so there we have it. That was the world population in 1895. Uh, we have exported them all over the world. We have been able to move them. We have got them onto auctions. We have, uh, uh, they have become an incredibly important component of the economy of, of nature conservation in this province and indeed in other provinces. Now, we get a lot of criticism from Kenya because for some obscure reason, everybody in Europe and America thinks that the home of conservation is Kenya. And whenever anyone wants to know about nature conservation, they consult a Kenyan. And they say, right, uh, Kenya says, we don't like this. We don't like that. We're not happy about South Africa because our, 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 our game reserves are fenced, which wasn't the case back in the 70s in, in Kenya. It is now, I might add, but not in the 70s. In the 70s, we had quite a dramatic change. Here. We were suddenly getting, the communities were coming on board, uh, pre predominantly the white farming community, and they, they wanted to start with uh, 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 conservancies. And then but we took the decision to try to get more wildlife and to give more freedom to landowners to use wildlife, all part of the sustainable use program. And what, what happened was that at the same time, Kenya took the decision that they were not going to allow any form of commercial utilization of their wildlife. So they stopped the great hunting industry, which was all part of the law of Africa in those days. And the net result has been, what has happened to our rhino population under a sustainable use regime has gone right up. This is now up in the 20,000. And this is what's happened in Kenya. And the amazing part is that nearly all the rhino in Kenya all come from South Africa. Then we were very fortunate to get Jan Ulufse uh, joining us, and he developed uh, our, our, uh, the, the Boma type capture for other animals, and they were marvelous because we managed to eventually get it so well we could capture game, put them straight into the truck without being touched by human hand. This was a very considerable difference to chase him after them in a, in a, uh, in a Land Rover. Giraffe were caught the, the same way, and for those of you that don't know a great deal about giraffe, you may. Uh, uh, ponder on the fact that there were no giraffe in this province. And there are quite considerable debates as to whether they ever did occur here. Uh, but as a result of them being popular animals, they've been introduced, and, and they're now one of the most uh, common animals in our, our, our Thornfell game reserves. And as a result, we developed the uh, game capture center, primarily to deal uh, with rhino, but with all other species. And then the private sector started game auctions. And they weren't particularly well run. Uh, they were held at, 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 at uh, 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 Sun City, uh, so there was a great deal of jollification and undoubtedly drinking. And a lot of animals died during the course of this. And Keith Mickleton here was our head of our game capture. He went up and studied these, came back, and gave us a set of recommendations, including that we should run our own auction in KZN. And we started the game auction. Natal game auction as it was then, Natal Passport game auction, and it became regarded as the champagne game auction uh, of the world. It would, uh, could demand the highest prices because of the quality of the game and the skills that had been developed by the game capture team in this province. And it, it, it really attracted a huge amount of attention. And at that stage, the people of, of the province and much of South Africa were 100% behind the policy of sustainable use. 
It didn't matter what we put onto the auction. Uh, uh, the, if we put on some of the rarer things like Red Diker and others, well, the prices were just ridiculous. And the nicest thing to have is a big kudu bull that licks the farmer's wife. They tame very quickly. So if you get a farmer's wife coming along and gets licked by a big kudu bull with horns, magnificent creature, man, the price of that spikes during the auction. Absolutely, what a great, that's, this, is, this is the biodiversity economy of all biodiversity economies. Right, and then we brought on the black rhino and that received a lot of criticism. John, Dr. John Ledger, a good friend and colleague, despite the fact of the day, he immediately criticized us by saying, what did we mean putting black rhino on? What were we going to do about the genetics? Well, as we started off with only about 40 uh, uh, black rhino in the province, uh, the, uh, there isn't a great deal we can do about the genetics. It isn't something you can go down to the chemist and buy a bottle of genetics. Uh, so we have to act in good faith. Uh, the trouble is a number of Americans with apologize uh, <laughs> to my, Ameri my colleague from the United States uh, who came up, Symboloff and co, who came up with the most incredible numbers about what you had to have in the way of 50,000 uh, breeding, uh, active breeding animals in a herd in order to prevent genetic drift. Well, he seems to have missed a few things like Indian miners in South Africa. Four were brought in from India. Uh, uh, the well-known uh, Rhodes, Cecil John Rhodes uh, of Cape University of Cape Town fame, he, he brought in six gray squirrels and we haven't noticed any genetic drift in our squirrel population. And if you go to New Zealand and you see red deer, Fraser Darling would, would be absolutely delighted because they brought in one load of, of red deer into New Zealand and they have colonized the whole of South Island. There's a massive industry involved in removing red deer and no sign yet of genetic drift after nearly 100 years. So these animals have done very well. Uh, we put them on the auction. You could bid on one and you had to take six. And these two gentlemen, Dale Parker and Clive Walker from La Palada Reserve paid 440,000 rand each for six. So the, the, uh, the reason why I was smiling that day, it was a huge income for the organization. Now we have been doing this since uh, Ian started to catch uh, white rhino and uh, uh, Peter he started to catch impala and other species and all told, here's just a sample, we take off about three and a half thousand head of game per year, surplus game from uh, KwaZulu-Natal parks. And over the time that we have been doing this, we have probably put a quarter of a million animals into the greater South Africa. And from that, the numbers have gone exponential. And the figures are vary considerably. The EWT did a, a, a review of a couple of years ago, uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, and he came up for a sample from some of the commercial uh, uh, private sector parks to say that there were about 4 million on those. And if you take all the other areas in Natal that are now in South Africa that are now stocked with wildlife, the, the figure of around about 20 million is not a bad one. It is absolutely incredible what has been done in this country uh, with our wildlife. Uh, our wildlife industry today, including tourism, etc., is probably moving up towards the 500 billion rand a year. This is a phenomenal amount of money uh, being brought in. The wildlife industry has grown dramatically. It is uh, we're growing at about 9.3, and I'd like to acknowledge Lizanne Nell, who unfortunately can't be here today, uh, to, for her contribution uh, to this. The, uh, and of course, as a result of all these skills in this province, uh, our old game capture center began uh, like uh, uh, topsy to grow and get a bit old, so we built a new one built on the skills learnt by our game capture teams and the bottom line is that we built a new game capture center in Falozi and in, in 2005 uh, the state produced a new uh, Bureau of Standards publication on the care and handling of wildlife and the care and handling of wildlife in South Africa is based entirely on what your conservation body did in this province. Pick a bit closer. All right. Okay, and, and the, uh, uh, with it we, we built, uh, we ensured that our uh, uh, local community was totally involved in the planning and building in this, and they have a very successful curio shop there. 
hunting, we see and always have seen hunting as a perfectly legitimate form of wildlife utilization. It is part of the conservation scene and what we should be concerned about is not that it exists, but that where it does exist, it is run according to the law. That is our job. The uh, other things you, you move off, we've, uh, we've built, uh, we added hunting areas to the protected areas in this province, and uh, we have a very successful hunting industry, but hunters are having a problem because the Department of Environment Affairs has begun to produce so many regulations, etc., that it is beginning to impact on the people wanting to come and hunt in this country, and we are losing out to N Namibia. We're actually uh, finding we're getting a, a, a drop in, in, in hunters coming to South Africa, and the new regulations that have just been published, as uh, possibly to be implemented soon, are simply awe-inspiring. You have to have a doctorate to fill in the forms, and you have to have an officer from DEA with every hunt, and that is impractical and nonsensical. So I hope that there are people going to make it a great deal easier and more welcoming for people to come to hunt in South Africa. Now, they banned hunting in Botswana a short while ago. This was not a good idea. And for those of you that would, uh, who can read here, you will see that huge amounts of money and jobs have been lost in the first 12 months following the ban. And, uh, and it's got worse uh, since uh, this pa paper has only just been published. But uh, since this, uh, this is two years out of date as far as the data is concerned. And I'm now delighted to hear that Botswana are considering reintroducing hunting, but hopefully in a, in a, in a more sensible manner. And I mentioned Kenya. Kenya, who is consulted by everyone as to why we shouldn't uh, shoot rhino, why we shouldn't uh, trade and horn, etc., all comes from Kenya. Negative, they, they always lead the charge against sustainable use. And here is a publication coming out from Brian Child shortly. And he, if you look at the lower rate here, up to 80% of their individual species have gone in the last 30 years. Kenya's wildlife is dropping at a phenomenal rate. And you compare this with South Africa, which is all going the opposite way, with a huge increase in, in, in land being committed to a conservation base, an effective conservation measure. Uh, it, I, I think it's a bit of a cheek for Kenya to keep turning around and pointing figures uh, at us. If you look here, Kenya has lost, according to this graph, uh, it was up until now, 67% of all of its wildlife. South Africa has increased our wildlife by 645. And I think this figure is wrong. I think that we have actually increased wildlife, large mammal populations in this country by 1,000%. So it's a phenomenal achievement. Now, here in KZ, uh, formerly we have uh, nearly 9% of the province formerly uh, uh, protected, two World Heritage Sites. We have 28% of the coastline, which is way above uh, the international uh, uh, target. And then we also had, in addition, conservancies, natural heritage sites, stewardship program now. Uh, all other effective conservation measures are now being recognized by IUCN as additional conservation land. And so South Africa has screamed past the 10% uh, uh, that was once spoken. And now I'm delighted to say, following the biodiversity movements of the state, in the marine areas, we have just increased our marine protected areas through the Pakisa program to 5% with a goal of 20% in due course. And I think South Africans should be extremely proud of, of the direction that we are still going on in South Africa. Now, any conservation body has to have should have three legs to its stool. It should know what it's doing. Our job is biodiversity conservation. Our job is not to worry about whether Vietnam smokes rhino horn. That's not our department, with the greatest of respect. We are not on the, uh, here to, to start uh, acting as some sort of moral guardians for other countries. It's for other countries to look after their things exactly as we do in South Africa for our own people. We should ensure that all people are involved. No question. The chairman of the board uh, mentioned that earlier, and we have certainly had a community outreach program in, uh, from which many of our members, uh, many of our communities have benefited, uh, as I'll show you in a moment. And you cannot forget economics. 
good agencies require funds to, to do anything properly. And so you cannot overlook that. Tourism, we have certainly looked at this province. There's Giants Castle Camp, for those of you that, that know the Drakensberg uh, in the 1950s, not the most aesthetic site I've ever seen, but a brilliant achievement. That is Giants Castle Camp today. It's an absolutely magnificent facility of which this country will be immensely proud. And we have put in rock art centers to, to a window, the wonderful rock art that we have in the Drakensberg. I might add that just this morning there was a Notice on News 24 to say that Kazakhstan should, has going to get, do better than we are because of their rock art. Well, two things were wrong. Firstly, uh, they said, look at the Cedarberg and look at Kazakhstan. Well, Cedarberg has got, <coughs> they only have single color rock art in the Cedarberg. It's all red or black. Here in the, the Tal Drakensberg sand, a blended colour. The only the only place in the world where rock art people actually blended colours and produced uh, the beautiful polychrome paintings. They are absolutely magnificent. And do you see it advertised in South Africa? No. But if you go to Australia, everything you see about Australia is prefixed by a big lump of red rock with absolutely no biodiversity on it, called Ayers Rock. <laughs> And they, and they mock it. it every time an Australian speaks. We should be learning. Uh, in the Zululand areas, we have done uh, huge, wonderful camps that we've developed. And we also, people tend to forget, black South Africans served on the board of the Natal Parks Board and as in Bello, uh, uh, Wala from 1977. That was long before it was politically correct. And we were uh, people like uh, uh, Gorsi Gmeda told us what the local people wanted. So funds were raised for the local communities, millions of rands that we raised outside of the park. We permitted resources to be collected in the parks of KwaZulu Natal, and we collected millions of rand were collected by our people. If you go to Zululand today, hands up those who last saw a traditional Zulu muzi made of thatch in any of the homelands, any of Ngonyama Trust land. And because the only place you can get decent thatch is inside the protected areas of Zululand. The rest has all been wiped out by too many cattle. Tourism level we brought in for our communities. 38 million rand has been paid out from our tourism levy over the last 20 years. The, it is a phenomenally successful program and it it has certainly, we have not overlooked the community. And people write, and they say that the people who are worried about dehorning rhino, people are getting no benefits. We have the Gumbi community in Zululand who, are, who have to dehorn their, hattle, their, their, their uh, uh, rhino to try to cut down on poaching, and all that resource is lying there wasted. It's not just the private sector uh, who is losing out as a result of this. It's our local people as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for okay. your time. Thank you,